This is an important piece of legislation. Um, and insofar as it seeks to improve the whistleblower's regime, its intentions seem laudable enough. Uh, and the provisions seeking to include uh, volunteers, shareholders, uh, per people belonging to administrative management or supervisory body of an undertaking, uh, and those who have a work-based relationship that is yet to begin, that all seems uh, good, or who are involved in a, a recruitment process, uh, that seems good. Uh, and I think the establishment of an Office for Protected Disclosures Commissioner in the Ombudsman uh, seems to be uh, a good thing. Uh, and the uh, enhancing the protections for workers who suffer penalisation as a result of a disclosure by changing the burden of proof in civil proceedings. Th these all seem uh, quite good. Uh, however, Whistleblowers Ireland make a number of criticisms. Officials are probably aware. Um, the first criticism they make is that uh, the, the guidelines for the 214 bill didn't a case, there was a legal case, I don't know, you might be aware of it, I'll see if I can fish it out here for you, but there was a legal case which established that the guidelines, uh, I think the case was uh, Clark versus CGI Food Services, um, and there was another one, Barania versus Rostera Irish Meats Group. Uh, I haven't looked at all the details of these, by the way. Uh, but the point they make is, in, in one of the rulings in relation to these cases, is that the guidelines produced in 2015 about the operation of the protected disclosures didn't actually act accurately reflect the law. Um, uh, so that is important uh, because, uh, at least according to Whistleblowers International, it meant a lot of the people who should have been afforded protection fell at the, to use their phrase, fell at the first hurdle uh, because uh, the actual code of practice that employers and others were using to operate the protected disclosures regime uh, was inaccurate. So that's pretty elementary stuff that the regulations flowing from the legislation should be accurate uh, and uh, should ensure uh, that the intent of the law is actually uh, given effect uh, and that the whistleblowers uh, have the protections that they are supposed to have. But the biggest concern I would have, and it again is reflected in whistleblowers, is that even the protections under the 214 Act, uh, did they work at all? Uh, are they acted upon? I mean, some people have asked about the uh, you know, the private sector now, is it, if, if you've more than 50 employees, you have to have your own channels. In the public sector, you have to have your own channels, even from the 214 Act. But certainly, I'm anecdotally aware, and I think others have mentioned examples, uh, that people who've attempted to make protected disclosures, they've gone absolutely nowhere. Uh, that nothing happens. Or, they make a protected disclosure, very little happens, and then they get uh, trashed for something completely different. Right? That, that's a classic tactic. So they make a protected disclosure about uh, malpractice, maladministration, wrongdoing. Next minute, they're holed up for something else. Uh, and then it becomes about them and what they've done wrong because basically they've, uh, the management or some power to be has decided to trash them. Um, uh, victimise them, blacklist them, or whatever. So what are we going to do about that? And I'm just not sure what is this legislation going to actually address that problem. Now it's a deep problem and I don't know all the answers uh, because first of all there is a fundamental imbalance between workers and bosses. That's just a fact, right? And if you are, uh, if you are uh, in the public sector or the private sector, the instinct of most management, senior management and employers 
If somebody below them kicks up, calls them out uh, on something, is to go for them. Because they're afraid that it could reflect badly on them. And that the book might stop with them or they could be held accountable. How do we deal with that fundamental imbalance of power? Um, and I, I, I really want to hear the government explain how that's going to happen. Um, and I wouldn't mind some hard facts. Now, maybe they are available, and I apologise, I'm not on the relevant committee, if there's a lot of hard facts available on all of this, about the details of what has happened with protected disclosures, public and private sector, uh, the numbers made, the numbers upheld, uh, the numbers that went nowhere, uh, are the facts and stats on all of this available so that we can actually assess the extent to which uh, the legislation had any effect uh, whatsoever? But it would seem to me that broadly speaking, you've got to have, and this is why I genuinely welcome the Office of the Protected Disclosures and the Ombudsman, you've got to have independent people who are genuinely in independent and resourced in order to uh, be the, uh, uh, the overseer, to make sure that whistleblowers are actually being protected and that the, uh, uh, the protected disclosures they are making, or allegations of wrongdoing uh, they are making in public or private bodies, uh, are actually being treated seriously. Uh, and that they are being fully investigated and that people are going to be held accountable uh, if uh, those uh, investigations uh, discover that there was merit, uh, there was validity or merit, or indeed even if they were just legitimate concerns that were being raised, even if they may not have been absolutely correct, because these things aren't always black and white, but where you've, somebody has genuinely held concerns uh, about things that are going on, have raised a complaint, even if everything they said didn't turn out to be true, uh, but that those concerns were legitimate, uh, that they will be protected, that the, the matter will be investigated, and that they won't suffer uh, retaliation, directly or indirectly. And I think there has to be some mechanism particularly to deal with, you know, because when, when management or the higher ups retaliate, they don't do it directly. They don't say, right, we're going to sack you, blacklist you, or whatever, because you made a protected disclosure. Of course, they're not going to do that. They're going to go for you uh, in other ways, uh, usually by trying to fit you up for something, or label you a troublemaker, or label you uh, vex vexatious. And one very important thing, and I'd like the Minister to say whether he feels the legislation deals with this, is what happens to people who uh, feel that there is wrongdoing, malpractice, abuse, whatever it might be, in a particular industry where the conditions of the workers are deeply precarious, where in fact it is not, they may not even have an employment relationship with the people that are abusing them, but where they're part of it, if you like, an industry or a sector. I mean, today, I think it's today, it's certainly been covered in the news today, and I'm aware of their complaints, we have representatives of performers in the arts, comedians and so on, uh, and we've had similar uh, allegations from uh, people in the trad music scene who would be um, self-employed people, loan traders, sole traders essentially, but they are dependent in reality for their employment uh, on a relatively small group of people, many of whom actually are funded by the state, get public money uh, in the arts and culture, but where there's a fear, a culture of fear, as they describe today, and I've heard this again and again and again, I've heard it from actors, I've heard it from musicians, I've heard it from all sorts of people working in the arts, where if you speak up about abuse, about malpractice, or whatever, you'll never work in this town again. That's the way it works. You'll never work in this, and that, that phrase is used 
quite often. Right? What are we going to do about that? Is that covered? Uh, and how are we going to actually vindicate it, if it is, uh, to make sure that it's effective? Because certainly, uh, that sort of thing, in my opinion, is widespread. And in some cases, and again, I'd like to know, can we, how can we address this? And I've raised it in other forums. Um, is, can we, in some cases, the employer denies that they are the employer, even though they are the employer. Bogus self-employment. Right, so what rights do you have if you're being misclassified uh, as a contractor when in fact you're not a contractor? Uh, you're an employee and you should have the rights of uh, an employee, but this is a way of the uh, employer denying their responsibility to you as an employee. Therefore, if you make a complaint, they don't have to process it because they're not your employer. Uh, we need to address that. A particular egregious example that I've raised many times in here is going on in the film industry. I don't know how many times I've raised it with the Department of Arts, Film, Finance, you name it, uh, where allegations have been made by film crew uh, that uh, the Section 481 tax relief is being abused. Um, and when they went in to a joint Oireachtas committee uh, in January 2018 and made these allegations, guess what happened? They never worked in this town again, having worked for decades in the film industry. If you go back and look at the names of some of these people, they'll be on the credits of films for the last 20 years, but they'll, they're, not, they're never working in this town again after they come into an Oireachtas committee. And what's interesting about this example is that the film all film productions in this country are funded with public money and they're conditional on giving, quote, quality employment and training, right? You're only supposed to get it if you get quality employment and training as a result. And under EU directives, you're also supposed to create a permanent pool of skills in that sector, notwithstanding the fact that filmmaking can be somewhat ep episodic, nonetheless you're supposed to have rights and you're supposed to have rights under the fixed term workers legislation, right, which deals with people who are in these situations of uh, episode to episode types employment, but you do actually accumulate rights of service under the law. But what happens in this instance is that when workers make complaints to the WRC that their rights are not being respected, the film producers who get the public money, conditional, I repeat, on the provision of quality employment and training, go into the WRC and say, not only are we not the employer of this person, even though we were the producer on the film on which they worked, we're not their employer, and in fact, we couldn't possibly have an employment relationship with them. And they're saying this in the WRC as we speak, and they've said it repeatedly and the representatives of Screen Producers Ireland also get public funding, go in, they collect the money from uh, revenue for providing quality employment and training, and then when the, the crew who are employed on these films make complaints, they say, we couldn't possibly have an employment relationship with you. It's the nature of our industry. We don't have employees. Uh, and you say anything, you never work in this town again. So how are we going to deal with that? Um, so I, I'd like to just, I mean, I'm putting those points out there because I, uh, I think they're relevant. Uh, I'm not saying I have all the answers, but um, uh, I think they need to be addressed. Because otherwise, you know, you can have all sorts of laws and intentions and all the rest of it, but unless they're actually going to be enforced, and if there's a mechanism to enforce them, unless there's a mechanism to stop the abuses, and particularly when the abuses and the nature of the sort of abuses we're talking about, when we're talking about the things that whistleblowers bring up, the, the, the retaliation they're taking, there is an inbuilt power imbalance, uh, is that most usually, if you like, it's people in powerful positions against whom the complaints are being made, who obviously have no interest in acknowledging the truth uh, of 
those allegations uh, and in fact have a vested interest in trashing the reputation and often the livelihoods uh, and lives of the people uh, who, uh, who make those uh, protected uh, disclosures. So, I'd be interested to hear the Minister's uh, response, and I would be particularly interested, if it, if it is available, just maybe let me know where it's available. If it isn't available, I would be very keen to see the, stack, the stats and the facts on the actual operation and effectiveness of the 214 uh, legislation, if such things are available. Thanks.